How's everybody doing? I'm here today with chapter three of book one of the Rangers Apprentice, the early years series, the tournament at Gorlin. And we're going to go ahead and get into it. There was no hearty beef stew, but there was a rich mutton broth, big chunks of tasty meat, and a hearty broth of vegetables. And there was fresh crusty bread to mop up the scraps. They ordered a bowl each and two more pints of ale to drink while they waited. Find a table, the innkeeper said, making an all-encompassing gesture around the room. Millie will bring your food. Without prior consultation, they both moved toward a table against the wall, at the far side of the room. It was well out of the immediate line of sight of anyone entering the tavern, but enabled them to keep a constant watch on new arrivals. The table was well away from the fire, and the nearest oil lantern was several meters away, so they were partially hidden in the gloom. For Halt, it was second nature to remain unobtrusive. He had spent several months traveling through Hibernia, avoiding recognition, and staying away from the search parties his twin brother sent after him. Crowley's training as a ranger must have left him with the same sense of reticence. Pritchard had taught Halt that rangers never sought to stand out from the crowd, preferring to blend in with the background. Millie, a pleasant-faced girl of about twenty-five, brought them bowls of mutton broth and two wooden spoons. She set a board down in front of them with a warm loaf on it and a knife. A small crock held rich yellow butter. Crowley took a sip of the broth and smiled contentedly. Oh, that's good. Halt followed suit and nodded agreement. The soup was hot and rich, and the heat of it seemed to spread through his tired, cold body. He even imagined he could feel the heat spreading down through his chilled and weary legs. Suddenly conscious of how hungry they were, after days of cold food and hard rations, they set to willingly, rapidly lowering the level in their bowls. Millie strolled past their table and indicated the near-empty bowls. More? she asked. It costs no extra for a top-up. Crowley instantly scooped the last of the mutton out of his bowl and crammed it into his mouth. Then he handed the bowl to the girl, nodding enthusiastically. Mmm, you fleef, he mumbled, around a mouthful of hot mutton and bread. She smiled and took the bowl then glanced interrogatively at Halt. How about you? He shook his head. The bowl was still a quarter full, and that would do him. Not for me, he said. She pointed to his tankard. How about more ale? This time, they both shook their heads, without any pause to consider the question. We're fine, said Crowley. Thanks. He smiled at her, and she returned the smile with some interest. He was a good-looking young man, with a cheerful, cheeky light in his eyes. She glanced at his companion. He was a different kettle of fish, she thought. His eyes were brown, deep-set under heavy eyebrows. His face was thin, and the beard was dark. There was something vaguely frightening about him, although she sensed no danger to herself from the man. Rather, she felt, there was potential danger for anyone who might cause him trouble. She realized her smile had faded as she studied the dark-bearded man, and she hastily readjusted it. It was professional good sense to smile at customers, she knew, even the ones who had a somewhat frightening aspect to them. She moved away toward the kitchen door, Crowley's bowl in her hand. I'll bring you your broth, she said. She was halfway to the kitchen, when the entrance door banged open, letting in a swirl of wind and rain and setting the smoke that hung about the rafters drifting uneasily. A stocky figure strode into the tavern, arrogance in every inch of his bearing. The room fell silent as all eyes turned to the doorway. The atmosphere was instantly heavy with distrust and apprehension. The newcomer was no farm worker or itinerant traveler. He was wearing a sword at his side, and he pushed back his black cloak. 
it could be seen that his black leather surcoat was adorned with a gold slash running from his right shoulder to his left waist, shaped like a lightning bolt. A tight-fitting leather cap covered his head. A smaller rendition of the yellow lightning bolt was on its front. He wore high riding boots, again in black leather, with his trousers tucked into them. The heels clacked loudly on the floor as he advanced a few paces into the room, allowing the door to close behind him. He looked around, taking in the fourteen people sitting at tables, and the innkeeper and his two serving girls behind the bar. If he was aware of the dislike radiating from the inn's customers, it didn't seem to bother him. He was probably used to creating a negative impression wherever he went, Halt thought. The newcomer's left hand dropped to rest on his sword hilt, a crude reminder of the fact that he was armed. Crowley leaned closer to Halt and said in a low voice, Black and gold, Morgoroth's colors. Halt nodded. He had seen them before, when they had visited Castle Gorlin. Eventually, the innkeeper broke the awkward silence that had gripped the room. Can I help you, traveler? he asked mildly. The newcomer's face creased with a scowl. It's Captain, he said abruptly. Captain Teasel, in Lord Morgoroth's service. He waited for the innkeeper to amend his method of address, but no amendment was forthcoming. And, said the innkeeper calmly, waiting for the soldier to voice his business. The scowl on Teasel's face deepened. He was used to cringing deference when he spoke to people he considered to be his inferiors, which included most people he met. But he could see no sign of deference from the innkeeper, and he was forced to continue. And, he said, placing sarcastic emphasis on the word, I'm searching for two renegade rangers, criminals, who've broken Lord Morgoroth's law. This is Caramon Fief, the innkeeper pointed out. The lord here is Baron Carroll. Baron Morgoroth has no jurisdiction here. Lord Morgoroth has been offended by these two men. I'm sure Carroll would want to assist him in apprehending them. The innkeeper shrugged. I'm sure Lord Carroll would if they were here, which they're not. Teasel glared at him, his hand opening and closing on the sword hilt. Do you have any guests at the moment? Have there been any travelers passing through? Halt, scanning the room unobtrusively, saw several of the other guests look instinctively to the table where he and Crowley were sitting. Fortunately, Teasel was concentrating his attention on the innkeeper, who was shaking his head. None, just locals here. At his words, Halt saw the other customers hastily avert their eyes from him and Crowley. The innkeeper appeared to be a man of some influence in Woolsey. I'll take a look around, Teasel said brusquely. The innkeeper shrugged. Suit yourself. But there are no rangers here, renegade or otherwise. Come to think of it, he added. I've never heard of a renegade ranger. Teasel, who had turned away, swung back on him. They've offended Lord Morgoroth and broken their oath. They've also injured several of his officers. As a result, they've been dismissed from the ranger corps. These are dangerous times, and disloyalty must be punished. The innkeeper made a compliant gesture with one hand. I'm sure it must, he said. Go ahead and look around if you want to. Teasel locked eyes with him for some seconds, trying to stare him down. The innkeeper held his gaze confidently. With men like this, he knew, it was best to remain firm and uncowed. Any sign of weakness or uncertainty would only increase Teasel's arrogance and overbearing attitude. Eventually, Morgoroth's men our man switched his gaze away from the innkeeper and turned to walk among the tables, studying the men seated there. Other than the serving girls, there were no women in the room. His heels clacked loudly on the floorboards as he moved slowly between the tables, 
stopping from time to time for a closer look. But the inn's clientele were obviously farmers or farm workers. They wore farmer smocks and thick working boots caked with mud. On several tables, felt hats rendered shapeless by years of rain and sun were evident. His inspection finished, Teasel grunted discontentedly. Then, he noticed the two figures seated at the back of the room, in the shadows. Quickly, he walked toward them, his left hand opening and closing on the hilt of his sword. He stopped a few meters from them, reaching up to the oil lamp that hung from the rafters, tilting it so that its light shone more directly on the two men. These were no farmers, he could see. They wore leather vests and woolen trousers tucked into knee-high leather boots. Fortunately, however, Holtz and Crowley's cloaks were currently spread across the backs of chairs in front of the fireplace and the room. Even without the distinctive mottled patterns, they would have raised his suspicions. And of course, their bows and quivers were in the room as well. Outwardly, there was nothing to show that the, they were rangers. Names, he said curtly. Crowley smiled disarmingly. Morris, he said, William Morris of Caramon. I'm Arate, Halt said briefly. He thought it best to keep his answers as short as possible to conceal his Hibernian accent. Crowley obviously realized what he was doing as he took the lead in the conversation. We're foresters in the service of Baron Carroll, he continued pleasantly. He was grateful that the innkeeper had mentioned the local baron's name a few minutes prior. Teasel sniffed. Foresters? A fancy name for poachers, if you ask me. Crowley shrugged. shrugged. There was no point answering such a statement. Teasel waited several seconds for a reaction. When none was forthcoming, he turned abruptly away, releasing the lantern so that it swung wildly back and forth, casting its yellow light in an arc. His heels clumped heavily on the boards as he strode to the door, ill temper obvious in every line of his body. He swung the door open, then turned back to the room, speaking to those present. I'll be in the neighborhood he said harshly. If anyone sights these two renegades, he'd be well advised to come find me. Silence greeted his statement. He let his gaze sweep the room once more, then abruptly went out, slamming the door behind him. A concerted release of pent-up breath swept the room as the customers relaxed. Gradually, conversations restarted, and the atmosphere went back to normal. Crowley and Halt rose from their table and moved to the bar. The innkeeper was still looking at the entrance where Teasel had left. Thanks for that, Crowley said, then added. Not that we're the ones he's looking for, of course. Of course, the innkeeper replied, the vestige of a smile touching his lips. But really, we don't owe Morgoroth and his men any favors. He's been throwing his weight around lately and we're getting heartily sick and tired of him interfering in this fief. I can imagine, Crowley said. The innkeeper shook his head in frustration. After all, we've got enough on our hands with Duncan and his band causing havoc in the district. And that's going to be the end of chapter number three. Thank you all for joining me today, and I will see you next time in chapter four. God bless, and have a good one.